Alright guys, welcome back to my monthly video game ranking series. And yes, I decided to do a monthly podcast thing. Because you guys seem to really enjoy the last two ones that I did. And when I first started doing this back in March, this was not a meme. The, 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 the This ranking tier system. It's like a meme now. It took a life of its own. iDubs and all the PewDiePie, all the big YouTubers are doing it. And it seems like everyone's hopping on this trend with uh, with no sign of it slowing down anytime soon. It's like it's taken a complete life of its own. When I first started doing this back in March, there were a handful of people making videos like this, but they it was not nothing nothing like it is now. So I'm not going to claim that I created this or that I that that I did anything to make it popular. I'm obviously a very small channel. So that's not the case. The only thing I created was I just I just made it a little bit neater because people had like S and A, B, C, D and and it was like different colors. Like the like D was green and A was red. But like when you think of excellent, you think of like blue being like the the best, the, the good color and F just being like the, the the red color just being awful. So I kind of made it look a little bit cleaner and a little bit more aesthetically pleasing but beyond that i can't claim credit for creating this uh th this ranking system i do prefer it to the top 10 list and i used to do top 10 list all the time back in the day i think i'm gonna stop doing that i think it's just gonna be this because the problem i have with with uh with top 10 list or top five top anything is that it's really obscure like why is this number two, but the other thing is number three, and, and then and then this is number one? It's just, I feel like when something is of the same quality as something else, ranking it above doesn't really do any justice. You know what I'm saying? So this is why I like this ranking system here, because there could, there could be two consoles or handhelds, or in this case we're talking about online gaming services, that the two of them could be just as good as each other and I don't have to say well this is better because I don't know it's just better like that that's how I feel these top 10 things go because you have to have a list and obviously you have to rank the list but when two things are of equal quality and you really can't say one thing is better than the other then it's kind of it's just kind of dumb, right, to, to, to do the top 10 list. So I think I'm going to quit that. It's just going to be this. Once a month, you're going to have some type of video game ranking thing. It's a, it's a whole – it usually takes me at least an hour to finish these. So, yeah, once a month is it, I think is good because it's a nice long video and it's a lot to talk about. And since I do no longer really have any podcasts – I used to do the 8-Bit Politics podcast – like a year or two ago, but uh, that has since been discontinued. So this is going to be the the podcast of the channel. And maybe I might do collaborations with other people, try to spice things up a little bit, but for the foreseeable future, this is going to be the format. So as I said before, today we're going to be talking about online multiplayer services. So think about the PlayStation Network, think about Xbox Live, Steam. Yeah, we're, we're gonna be we're gonna go across console gaming, PC gaming, and even mobile gaming. And we're gonna see which services are among the absolute worst that are just downright terrible, all the way up to the best online multiplayer services to have ever existed. And when I think of bad services when i think of of services that deserve an f ranking i think of online services that really have no reason to exist whatsoever uh, the motivations behind it existing is just blatantly just just to line people's pockets and for greedy purposes like it doesn't actually add anything or contribute anything to the video game industry that's what i think of an f ranking it's just and not just that but it lacks the mo the basic key fundamental features that you would expect from an online gaming service. 
for its time, right? Because we are being time relative here. So I'm not going to say, for example, the PlayStation Network is better than SegaNet because the PlayStation Network has more features. Because SegaNet came out a decade before the PlayStation Network did. So we're not going to do that. But for its time, by, by the standards of the time where it was released compared to its competitors, it lacks the most key basic fundamental features that you would expect from a service. And it lacks almost all of them. So it, it doesn't just lack a few or maybe you know a, a few important ones. No, this just is just all around terrible. And if, if, if a gun were not being pulled to your head, you would not use it. And in a lot of cases, you would, you, you're just going to not use it anyway, even if companies are trying to force you to use it. So I threw a little shade there. Uh, to, to, I'm, I'm sure uh, you, my viewers are very smart. You can figure out at least one of the entries <laughs> on this list, on this ranking list doesn't take a genius to figure out which one of the what stores what stores are going to be on there uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are, uh, have already figured that one out but before we do that actually no let, let's just we'll do the f ranking because i was going to go over all the rankings but i think it makes more sense to just be like yeah this is what my criteria is for an f ranking and then we'll just go over the stuff that actually deserves an f so that's what we're going to do here so Let's begin. Yeah, uh, that was not very hard to predict, the Epic Game Store. <laughs> I'm sure you all knew that like, as soon as I started talking about what makes an online multiplayer gaming service the worst. The, the, the criteria that I listed perfectly describes the Epic Game Store. The only reason why the Epic Game Store exists is to line the pockets of Tim Sweeney, the Chinese <laughs> and the the greedy developers and publishers that uh, they want the the, the eighty eight was it eighty eight twelve is the split compared to Steam which is like seventy thirty and you can sympathize with that with developers feeling like they deserve a, a bigger cut of their work absolutely I'm not I'm not trying to portray all like the developers and publishers as evil but the stories that we've heard. And the way that they that that a lot of these uh, publishers and developers have gone about epic exclusivity is really a point of concern here. Especially uh, a few games that come to mind are the Outer Worlds, which uh, at its Game Awards reveal had a, a Steam logo on it, and it is timed exclusive, so it technically is coming to Steam, but not until 2020. So there's this meme that I can't wait. 2020 is going to be a great year for for gaming. You're going to have Outer Worlds. And you're going to have Borderlands 3 because that, that was another situation. Although they, they didn't specifically say that this game is going to come to Steam. And they didn't advertise a Steam release date. But they kind of uh, hid that it was going to be an Epic exclusive at the presentation to avoid bad press. I, I guess you can understand why they did that. Now you got this whole Randy Pitchford thing which is just like... Uh, that, that has nothing to do with the Epic Game Store. But yeah, Borderlands 3 seems like it's going to be a mess. Uh, so any any hardcore Borderlands fans out there, I really feel bad for you because it looks like it's geared for disappointment. But Ep Epic Games, the, the huge problem I have with Epic Games isn't even that that developers want a bigger cut and Epic Games offers a, a much a significantly smaller smaller share between the, the, the storefront and the publisher. Because that's appealing, and that's a that's a competitive aspect of Epic Games, and there's they have enough money to sign these exclusivity contracts, and whether you like it or not, that is the definition of competition. When you have something of of similar magnitude that can rival that, the, the, that could just throw money around like you can, like these big 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 corporations going at each other, that is really the textbook definition of what competition is and you may hate the epic game store i obviously do because epic game store got an, a, a big fat f from me but that's that's how competition is but i i think a lot of people share the same concern like i do that this is really not true genuine competition 
it's it's just a cheap way to artificially increase the user base. It, it was already huge from Fortnite, and that's really the only reason why the Epic Games launcher existed. They didn't want to share their profits with with Valve and Steam. That's how PC gaming is. It's an open and free platform, so any company can go out and choose to, to sell the game however the way they want. But if uh, Epic Games wants Fortnite on the PlayStation, they obviously have to work with Sony. They obviously have to work with Microsoft. They want it on the Xbox or Nintendo with a Switch. So that's 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 how PC gaming is. It's one of the, I guess you could say, drawbacks of PC gaming. Although it's not entirely negative. But uh, th this, is, this is the thing about Epic Games. It lacks the most basic fundamental features that we expect from a 2018 slash 2019 online gaming service there's no no t no chat no no uh no voice chat in the in the actual client no achievements no user reviews and i understand that i i even think you know the playstation and xbox even have user reviews not as complex as steams but even they they allow you to rank like to to, to give star ratings to certain games with Epic Games, you can't even do that. I think I think they might have edited it in. They had this whole road ma roadmap of features coming out, short term features. I th I think that might have been one of the features, and then he has long term features like a shopping cart. A shopping cart is a long term. Is there a long term goal? They obviously rushed this this service out with no no true intention to actually create like to actually improve PC gaming because I'm under no illusion that Steam is like the, the, the end all be all like it's it's the, the absolute perfect perfect service because such a thing d does not exist so there's always room for improvement but the Epic Game Store is not that solution the only thing that all Valve has to do is literally take a lower cut and Epic Game Store will be will be completely destroyed because w w the thing that all these developers are doing, right, is that they 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 it's a calculated risk. You see, people are understanding like, oh, th this game is going to fail because it's on Epic Game Store. You do realize that these people, the, the the people in charge of these of these publishing studios, they think long and hard about these decisions. They don't just make irrational decisions out of nowhere. They make them because they figure they will make more money in the long run than if they go on Steam because of the lower cut that's part of it and also the game is not going to be susceptible to user reviews and user reviews are a huge factor in a lot of people deciding whether or not to, to purchase a game and also in Epic Games there's, there's less of a sense of community and that's really like when I think of an online gaming service I think of community there being a huge community of players that all have the same you know that, that are all part of a, of one huge community epic games has no sense of community in it whatsoever which is a great thing for developers and publishers because there's no sense of community so players you know they, they don't they don't have groups they don't have user reviews to to actually complain and I think Epic Games does have reviews, but it's it's very it's it's highly regulated and curated by Epic Games. So anything that's suspected of review bombing, for example, or anything like that, it's a lot more strict. Even after Steam reformed their their review policy, because before it was like you could review bomb a game to to death, and there'll be you know no nothing will happen. Like it, it's just going to stay that way. Steve, Steve Valve was not going to regulate that. They seem to have changed that a little bit. But Epic Games is just I mean it's 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 reflective of their largest investor, Tencent. It's Tencent. It's highly regulated. It has no it really has nothing to it. Like it's just it's just created out of greed. And the Epic Game Store is just a stain on PC gaming. And that's truly how I feel about it. At first, I was indifferent. I was like, competition's a good thing. But th the way that, like, as an actual platform, the Epic Game Store is downright awful. It has virtually no redeeming qualities to it whatsoever. 
And that's why the Epic Game Store deserves a big fat F. I know I, I went on a whole thing earlier about how much I hate top tens. But I think Epic Game Store out of the three uh, out of the three of these lot. I think Epic Game Store is at the bottom here. I'm not gonna lie. Then we have Games for Windows Live. I don't know if you guys remember Games for Windows Live. I actually had a recent experience with it, even though it was closed down. I purchased Grand Theft Auto 4 on Steam, but it's still DRM locked to Games for Windows Live. So although Games for Windows Live shut down years ago, there are still some games like Grand Theft Auto 4 uh, and the most notably Fallout 3 that were so tied to the service, uh, the DRM, and like the, the overall the way that the game worked, that if you if since games for windows live shut down uh key parts of the game like did not function properly so with fallout 3 you have to download a like some type of compatibility patch like an unofficial patch or else you can't really play it it's going to be completely broken because uh, it, it, it runs through games for windows the way i personally play fallout 3 is with uh the ttw mod if if you uh don't know what that is you should really look it up but I, I had Grand Theft Auto 4. Grand Theft Auto 4, which, uh, you know, it was nice coming back to it. I'm sure you guys remember that over the past few months. A lot of the, the gameplay commentaries I've been doing, a lot of it was Grand Theft Auto 4 footage. And it just brings me back to a time period where gaming was like, honestly, at its golden age. I know, I know a lot of people consider the golden age to be maybe the Super Nintendo and Genesis, but I honestly think the seventh generation was the greatest console generation to have ever, to have ever existed. I think Grand Theft Auto 4 is a much more deep, it's much more, a much more rewarding and fulfilling experience than, than Grand Theft Auto 5. Grand Theft Auto 5, the mechanics and the combat and the overall, the overall aesthetic to it is just dumbed down for a mass audience. And that, that really just describes the gaming industry today, all summed up in one word. It's just appealing to the lowest common denominator of people, not creating a fulfilling and challenging experience. I mean, when, when, one of the biggest debates that we have is should there be an easy mode for a game? I think that's telling <laughs> for the current state of the game because people are used to being pampered, right? And I am no exception to that. I did say Sekiro deserves a should have a, an easy mode, um, so I I kind of uh, deserve some I, I deserve some blame for that too. I'm kind of a little bit spoiled growing up in the online age of video games where you have tutorials and and uh, and let's plays and all that where you're kind of you're, the, the, your your hand is being held the whole time and people don't really challenge themselves as much as they used to video games used to be a challenging thing but e even like not even gameplay wise right even just like just the just the narrative right i feel like the the narrative of video games has, has also been dumbed down uh, quite substantially over the years video games used to have the most compelling and immersive storytelling now i don't i don't know so much about that but games for windows live in my opinion was back around the time period where uh, the gaming industry was 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 pretty good, but this was one of those ugly stains, uh, especially for Microsoft because they 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 were killing it for so long. They decided to to make a foray into PC gaming, and my copy of Grand Theft Auto Four is still tied to Games for Windows Live. So I actually had to sign into Games for Windows Live to to play GTA Four, and it actually still works, which is weird. Because I thought it was shut down. I guess there's still some aspects of it that are still online, that are like connected to Xbox Live. Because when I, when I log into GTA 4, it tells me I signed in. And it tells me all my friends that are online on Xbox. It's kind of like a, a dashboard thing. It's it's weird. But the reason why Games for Windows Live was so terrible, uh, I'm sure a lot of people who are PC gamers a decade ago would remember this. It was. <sighs> It was just a tactic for Microsoft to cut into the PC gaming market. And that's fine. Microsoft feels like they're entitled to, to get a piece of the action because at the end of the day, Windows and, and PC gaming, that, that's all Microsoft's creation. So it pissed them off to no end that companies like Valve were making a killing off of their platform, right? So I guess it made sense for 
for Microsoft to to foray into PC gaming. But the problem with 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 games from Windows Live is very similar to that of the Epic Game Store. Uh, you did have a good number of uh, exclusivity contracts. It, it helped that Microsoft had good standing relationships with a lot of these publishers because of the 360. The PlayStation 3 at that time was in was in a dire state, so most of these uh, publishers had a, a good relationship with Microsoft because of the 360. So in turn, that relationship transferred pretty well over into PC gaming. So you had a lot of a lot of big companies like Bethesda and Rockstar, for example. They uh, th they supported the games for Windows Live service, and it really it, it had a lot of the key features that you would expect from Xbox Live. They really tried to have it like Xbox Live on PC. I mean, it was called Games for Windows Live, kind of like Xbox Live. The problem with Games for Windows Live is that they they thought that having the pay the, the paid subscription model of consoles was going to carry over very well into PC gaming. And although Games for Windows Live did have some okay features, it was still nothing compared to Steam. The game library was nothing compared to Steam. I mean, there was nothing really that Games for Windows Live had that Steam did not. And usually I'd be kind of lenient and give it a D, but because Games for Windows Live was such a huge, huge abysmal failure, and literally the only reason for its existence, kind of like the Epic Game Store, was just to line pockets and not, not to innovate. That's why I gotta say, Games for Windows Live uh, deserves, a, deserves a big fat F here, because it, it definitely remains one of the ugliest stains uh, in PC gaming history. This was literally the Epic Game Store. I mean, this was nothing like the Epic Game Store, actually, but if, there was, if there's an equivalent to the Epic Game Store 10, 11 years ago in PC gaming, it would be Games for Windows. I just don't know what they were thinking. Charging fifty dollars a year to play games for the for the for the privilege of paying pay, of playing games online, paying a subscription fee when people had Steam for years at that point and they had no intention to start paying now. So I, I th Microsoft's getting into PC gaming again. That I know they won't be stupid enough to charge to charge sixty dollars a year for for online. No way. No way that's going to happen. So, yeah, Games for Windows Live was just awful. And anybody who was around PC gaming back then can attest to that. It was just a... And it still has its effects to this day with games that really have a hard time functioning without DRM, which brings up a question about DRM and, and are we really... Is it really a good thing for us to head towards this all digital especially the streaming nonsense that's going on is that really a good thing for for the video game industry and for for the for the community because it's really hard to preserve history at that point when everything's all digital when everything is all streamed it's kind of hard because with netflix you could just screen cap it and record so if netflix shuts down you're probably still going to be able to watch orange is the new black but when it comes to these these services, uh, when it comes to these gaming streaming services, like for Stadia, for example, what happens if and when Stadia shuts down? What happens to all the games that you played, all the hours you put in? What happens to it? And that's what really scares me about these streaming services. But moving on to the next F tier <laughs> online service, if you even can, if you can even call it that, but I decided to to classify it as that because. The GameCube did have online, and the picture that you see right now is the official Nintendo licensed GameCube adapter. And the thing is, Nintendo didn't really give a crap about online multiplayer at that point. And they they never pretended to care. So naturally, it's not going to be good. <laughs> the GameCube's online, and let me tell you the problem with it. It's not necessarily that playing games online the GameCube was on its own a bad thing. But compared to Xbox Live at the at the time, PlayStation 2 Online at the time, and even SegaNet, which preceded it, GameCube was just completely lackluster. It didn't really didn't really it wasn't really a fulfilling experience. Like it really wasn't a good online gaming experience, even for its time. 
I mean, obviously, it didn't have, like, adding friends and all that, but it's really only... It's really mainly because Nintendo didn't care. And also, they only supported eight games. Can you imagine, even even back in, like, 2003, 2004, an online gaming service only supporting eight games? Yeah. So the Nintendo GameCube Online really was not a good experience. It, it was pretty shitty, actually. And overall, it, it's, a, it's a pretty big fail. Nothing like the Epic Games and Games for Windows Live, but a, a big fail nonetheless. And I'm sure a lot of people tuning in didn't even know that the GameCube even had internet or even had online. But it did. And considering that nobody remembers it, but people knew that the PS2 and Xbox had online, but most people don't, don't even know that the GameCube had online, is pretty telling. So the GameCube network adapter, the GameCube online, whatever you want to call it, deserves an F ranking. So now let's talk about the D tier. So we, we talked about services that really were just were just all around awful they lacked key features that were modern standards at that point the games for windows live was just so lacking in comparison to steam and epic game store even more so compared to steam uh, but i think what, what 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 puts games for windows live on a somewhat equal footing to epic game store was the was the yearly subscription thing i think that's what really <laughs> made games for windows live deserve an f ranking if they didn't have a subscription and if it still failed at any way I might have been generous to give it a D, but no. An F is is a service that's all around terrible, and it it's just uh, not a good not a good experience, not a good online game experience. But with D ranking, these are services that are mm, marginally passable. For, so they do have they they kind of like F. They do lack a lot of key fundamental features that you would expect from the time period that the service was, was out. But it was barely passable. Like you, you still were able to get some enjoyment out of it. It wasn't all bad, like the Epic Game Store is, like Games for Windows Live was, and the GameCube. I think of a D ranking, I think of, of services on the D tier as services that just existed just for the purpose of existing. I know that's the point for Epic Games and Games for Windows Live, but just overall uninspiring. They just existed to make money, similar to F, but we're still a, a marginally better experience. So let, let's, let's take a look at the D tier and you'll see what I mean here. So these are the three services that are on the D tier. We have the Nintendo Switch Online for starters, which is pretty damn awful. Let, let's 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 be honest; it's just barely passable. But I couldn't I couldn't say that the online Switch was just as bad as the Epic Game Store. I couldn't because the Switch Online does not have uh, these exclusivity contracts. The Switch Online, even though it is very is a very bare bones service. It still looks like, like like it belongs in the S tier compared to the Epic Game Store. <laughs> Maybe that's a bit of an exaggeration, but it still it still makes makes the uh, the Epic Game Store makes the Switch Online look pretty damn good actually, because the F range is very wide ranging, right? Because obviously, if you get a C in a class, or you get like a seventy something, right? That's that's a C average. A sixty something is a D, but uh, anything below a sixty from a from a fifty nine to a zero can be in the F tier. So that's why I have to say that the Switch Online is probably still a lot better than the Epic Game Store. But it's still not good, not even close. Uh, for 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 a service that came out in two thousand seventeen, for for a console, it's embarrassing. And you could be the biggest Switch fan to ever to ever exist. You could love everything about the Switch. 
but objectively speaking, you cannot say that the Switch Online is a good service and a good value. The key argument is, well, it's paid online, but it's cheap. You know, it's only like, what, $30 a year, which is still, which is significantly cheaper than PlayStation Network Gold or PlayStation Plus and Xbox Gold. But I don't accept that excuse because it still sucks. And there's nothing about it that warrants the subscription fee when you have a lot of contemporaries, especially on the PC gaming side, that offer way more features and do not charge you a cent to play games online. So the Switch Online is terrible. I mean, it's it's barely passable. You can have a decent experience. You can add friends and, and do whatever. No voice chat. Yeah, no voice chat. Do I even need to explain what's wrong with that in 2019? That an online, a premium online gaming service has no voice chat. And I don't mean to beat on a dead horse because a lot of people make fun of the fact that you need to use a phone app, an app on your phone in order to do voice chat. <laughs> what? Like, what is this? It, it, like, it makes no sense at all. It really doesn't. I guess it's some way for Nintendo to kind of curate things to like to like protect the children, because it's not like Nintendo is incapable of having native voice chat. They just refuse to be bothered, and I, I guess Nintendo's base is more casual, and I guess would care less about that kind of thing. But it's still dumb. And what do they offer you? You have this subscription service. You can get free. Nintendo, first of all, it's not free because you are paying and you're forced to pay it, but we'll say the word free because that's the way they say it. Free NES games, you know, from 30 years ago that people have either beaten to death or that haven't aged that well that people do not want to play. Let's be honest here. Do you honestly think NES games are an enticing enticing thing that sets the, the Switch Online apart from the competition? Let's be honest here. It's it's a scheme. They want you to pay. It costs them absolutely no money to put these games on their subscription for the free games because like I said everyone's played them and uh, they 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 people have probably played them, bought them 3 4 times over. And that's another thing. There's no virtual console, so the library is is not very good. But in terms of overall features it just it feels very primitive it doesn't it's not that not that good and it, it only exists for the purpose of playing games on the switch online but it's not good <laughs> like it's, it's really not good it's more it's better than the epic game store i i, I felt like it would have been too mean to put it on the on the f rank because the Nintendo Switch store, as greedy as it is, and even with the paid online, is still better than the Epic Game Store. Because at least they have their own games on there. right? Epic Games has Fortnite, and they steal games from their competition. Nintendo doesn't really do that. So from a consumer-friendly point of view, you would still prefer the Switch over the Epic Game Store. But overall... It's, it's, it's just, uh, it has a lot of room for improvement. Let, let's just put it nicely. Next to it, we have the PS2 Online. I'm sure a lot of you were wondering, like, what is this? It's, it, it looks familiar, that, that, uh, that logo, but couldn't quite piece it together. No, that, that's the PS2 Online. It didn't have an official name. Some people called it the... PlayStation 2 Broadband, PlayStation 2 Online, PS2 Online, whatever it was. And people might think, wow, like that's kind of harsh, ranking the PS2 on, on the D rank. But this did come out around the same time as Xbox Live on the original Xbox, and it's leagues. Xbox Live is le was leagues be uh, ahead of the PS2 Online. The only thing you'd be able to do on PS2 Online was play games online, and that was about it. 
<laughs> there was really nothing else to it. And it was not seamless. Like, you couldn't just connect to it. You had to buy a modem if you had a fat PS2. If you had a regular PS2, the modem was actually built in. But uh, the slim PS2, it was built in. But overall, it was a very, it really wasn't that good. The PS2 overall was definitely a better system than the Xbox, but the online service, I mean, man, you had the party chat, you can talk, you can add friends online, it was it was like a, an amazing social experience, it truly revolutionized online gaming. Compare it to the PS2 broadbands, and I can't rank it higher than a D. Might be a little bit harsh, but when you can't communicate with your friends at a, at a time when that was really starting to become the norm... I can't really rank it any higher, so that's where the PS2 stands, the PS2's online broadband. It did support a significant amount more games than the GameCube did, so that's why it's a D, but uh, the online experience on Xbox was just, it, it's like, for lack of a better analogy, well actually this is a great analogy, compare Xbox Live today to the Switch Online. Compare that to Xbox Live back in the day to PS2 Online. It's the same deal. And I am trying to be fair with, with t like at its time, but I still, at its time, can't give it higher than a D. I know some people had enjoyment out of it, but some people also have enjoyment out of, out of playing Splatoon 2 Online. But that doesn't mean that the service is actually good. You know what I'm saying? Some people can have enjoyment out of playing Fortnite. But the overall level of enjoyment is nothing compared to if you had Xbox Live. Even with the paid subscription, it was, it was, it was actually worth it back then. Then we got Battle.net. <laughs> Battle.net. Uh, it's not inherently terrible. Like, if it had games, it would probably be ranked a little bit higher. But really, the only purpose of having Battle.net is to play Overwatch and World of Warcraft, and that's it. Other than that, there's really no reason to, to have Battle.net. And there are other services that are the same way, but they at least have a lot more games and they actually have like a lot more reason to actually install it. So that's why Battle.net deserves a D because it's marginally acceptable. It gets the job done. You can add friends, you can chat, but that's about it. Uh, and Activision's involved in it, so that, that tells you enough about... <laughs> about Battle.net and why it's not not very good <laughs> so that's the that's the D rank and we're almost 40 minutes in and we haven't even reached the halfway point yet this is gonna be this is gonna be good so let's take a look at the C tier so the C tier is like your middle of the road online service it's not bad by any stretch of the means but it's also not good it, it gets the job done. It, it's an okay experience. There, there's a lot of room for improvement, but it's also acceptable. Like, you don't have a lot of bad things to say about it, but you also don't have a lot of good things to say about it either. It's just, it passes. You, you, you might have some fond memories with it, and you might enjoy it, but in terms of uh, innovation and all that, it doesn't really do anything. Like, it doesn't... It doesn't really contribute that much to the online gaming experience. It just exists for the purpose of existing almost. Not very inspiring. But it's still better than something on the D tier. Because you, you get a lot more enjoyment out of these services than, than those on the D tier. So without further ado, let's talk about the C. These are the five services that I have decided are worth a C ranking. So, let's start off with the Nintendo Network, which is very ironic. The Nintendo Network was the online service for the, for the, for the Wii U and the 3DS. Came out in 2011, because that's when the 3DS launched, so it, it had online. Mario Kart 7 was the one that I remember the most. And I had a decent experience. For the 3DS, it was actually pretty decent for a handheld compared to the Vita Online, which was definitely a lot better via the PlayStation Network. But uh, 
it was still an okay experience. I, I, I didn't say that this was awful, but it also wasn't good. And on the Wii U side of things, it actually had more features and was an overall better service than the Switch Online is today. So the Nintendo Network precedes the Switch Online by about five years and was a better service that had more features and was an overall better service. You didn't have to pay for online, which they wouldn't have been able to get away with that anyway because the Wii U was a, was, a, was a bust. But still, no paid online. And you could actually have voice chat, in-game voice chat, without having to have a goddamn smartphone app. And you also had the Miiverse and a, and a, a few cool cool little things that made it really seem like a a social like like you were part of a community of players because that's really like what what a, a big fundamental thing is i think when it comes to having a a good what i would call an acceptable online service with with this lot you don't really feel like you're part of a community you just play games and that's it you know what i mean like you, like i know there's a huge nintendo community but there's still no sense of community with the Switch Online, in my opinion. Like you have you have people who play Smash, but with that no with no voice chat in game, that automatically kills the online experience for the Switch. So the Wii U actually had better online. You did have a, a number of games that did not support it, that did not support the voice chat, like Splatoon, which was an epic fail. But you still had that option. You did not have to download a goddamn app on your smartphone, which is was just terrible. Absolutely terrible. So the Nintendo Network deserves a C rating. It wasn't particularly bad, but it wasn't good either uh, compared to the, the PlayStation Network of the PS3 and the 360. And especially when you got to the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One, it obviously was very lacking in terms of features in comparison. But it, it had a virtual console. Nintendo Switch Online did not have a virtual console. And uh, that, that probably automatically makes it better as well. Because it actually had games. It actually had a, a decent library. Although it was kind of stupid for them to to reset the VC from from Nintendo Wi-Fi. And we're, we're about to talk to, about Nintendo Wi-Fi right now. I could not rank Wi-Fi higher than the C as well. Because again, comparing it to... The, the, the online gaming's boom of the, the mid-2000s with Xbox Live and the PlayStation Network. The Nintendo Wi-Fi connection on the, on the Wii and, and the DS was very lacking in, in, in comparison to its competitors. Now, I had a lot of enjoyment out of the Wii Online. I actually didn't even know I could connect the Wii to the internet until someone told me. I remember um, the light on my Wii, like the, the power button was red, and my other, my friend, when I went to their house, it was orange, and I'm like, why is mine red and yours orange? And they and they explained to me that they're, they're connected to the internet, and I'm like, you can go on the internet on the Wii? I was like mind blown as, as a 10 year old, because I didn't really care about that kind of stuff, but when I once I got into it, it was like a, a whole new world, the everybody votes channel, <laughs> the, the, um, uh, the Weather Channel, they had, they had all these different channels, and it really made you feel like you were part of a community. And the Miis, oh man, the Miis. You could download Miis from other players, and it, it really, you did feel like you were part of a community. Definitely a kid community, and definitely a, not not as free and open as the other ones, so you didn't have as many good features, and you had the friend code thing, which annoyed me to hell. And by the way, the Switch still has friend codes. In, in, in 2019, Nintendo still uses friend codes just blows my mind. Nintendo is, is living in the 1990s. <laughs> I know people are thinking I'm being really unfair with Nintendo. Hey, Nintendo's great, but this is a video dedicated to online gaming and Nintendo has always failed at that. You got the GameCube, the Wii, the, the Wii U, the Switch, and they haven't gotten anything higher than the C. Nintendo just has very poor, very embarrassing online infrastructure for the most part. But I'll be fair with the Wi-Fi connection. I did get some good enjoyment out of it, and they did have some nice features that really made you feel like you were part of a community and part of a real network. Although, like I said, there were a lot of key features that were lacking. 
and you could say well it's because it was mainly for kids so they're obviously not going to have like all the features they, they want to make it like more closed experience and you know not talk with strangers on the internet because you know kids can't be exposed to that kind of stuff i guess i don't know but i remember that my experience playing mario kart it's a pretty funny experience mario kart wii on the wii and i was playing online with my friend back in the day in fourth grade and he we, we we talked the way we played online the way we communicated with each other was through a landline telephone like i called him like his mother's phone because that that's how we call that's how we talked to each other back in the day there were no smartphones or cell phones back then so we had that and that's how we were able to communicate online with each other on the nintendo wii but you know what we still made the best out of it and we still enjoyed our experience so i'll give nintendo wi-fi connection a c because it did at least make some effort so that's nintendo wi-fi connection that's pretty much all of nintendo their services next we have the apple game center so i did say we're going to talk about every medium we're going to talk about consoles pcs and mobile for, for a mobile online gaming service, Apple Apple Game Center is okay. It doesn't really wow me in any way, but it's probably also because I don't like Apple very much. It has a decent library of games on the, on the iOS store. It has a friend system. It has achievements and uh, scoreboards and all that kind of stuff. So it's cool, I guess. It's better than, than nothing. But a little bit lacking and i want to spend too much time talking about apple so i want to move on to the origin origin store and you play which kind of go hand in hand but we'll start off with origin origin i came to enjoy i, gr I grew to enjoy it at first like if i was doing this ranking in 2011 2012 i would probably give it a d maybe even an f because Origin back then kind of rem reminds me a little bit of Epic Game Store, but Ep but Origin actually has a, a a decent amount of of features that you do come to expect. You can chat with friends, and do a lot of the basic stuff that you would expect to do in an, on an online gaming service. But I think considering the library of games, and I do overall like the design, uh, the the overall interface of Origin. I like the I like the, the, the overlay. The web browser is probably the best the best uh, web browser out of all of these launchers, in my opinion. It's, it's fast, it's sleek, it's nice. So I do like it, but at the end of the day, if it weren't for the fact that EA forced you to, to have it in order to play their games, I would not use it. And it doesn't really particularly do anything uh, exceptionally well compared to its competitors. Like, it doesn't really have anything over its competitors besides its, its library of EA games. And... If you don't like EA games, you'd probably rank this even lower than a C. But I had a lot of enjoyment out of Dragon Age Origins, of of, uh, of a good number of games that were on EA, but I don't play, like, Anthem or any of that garbage. Uh, but th those... Th that th those uh, they, they put Battlefront 2 on there, uh, on the vault, because I am a, I am an Origin Access member. So I, I, do, I do have a good experience with that. And Mass Effect, Mass Effect Trilogy is probably the greatest gaming trilogy to have ever... To have ever existed and probably ever that ever will but i thought origin was okay but like i said because it forces me to to use it in order to play ea games and it doesn't really do anything better than the competition i gotta i gotta leave it in the c tier and then you play kind of a bit of the same it's a little bit better in the sense that you play they, they do they do sell their uh their games on other on other storefronts so they sell it on steam but now they're selling them on epic so eh. but <laughs> with you play it's a, it's a decent network you do have a decent friend network and uh you do get some good deals on ubisoft games and it's okay it, it like i said doesn't do anything particularly well but it's a, it's a nice interface it's 
it doesn't it, it's 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 okay like i i think you play does things better than than the switch online so that's why i gave it a c as opposed to a d and it reminds me a lot of origin so that's why i decided to to lump it alongside with origin because they're really both the same deal like you really wouldn't play it if it weren't for the fact that you were kind of forced to if you want to play their games although you play is a little bit better with that but uh who knows like we'll, we'll we'll see what the future entails with you play but since they're moving since they're moving a lot of their games to epic game story it might as well be exclusive to you play you might as well need you play because you play is still a lot better <laughs> than the epic game store uh significantly so that's the C tier. So we're halfway through, 50 minutes in. Wow, did not expect this to, to take as long. Probably because I spent a good chunk of time bitching about the Epic Game Store. But let's talk about the B tier. These are online gaming services that are good. They're not great, but they're good. There's a lot of room and a lot of room for improvement, but overall, it's it's a good experience. Like it has a lot of a lot of good features. It has even even innovated in a lot of ways. Like without these services, the gaming industry uh, would not be the way it is today. So you gotta you gotta give it some credit. But it's not among the best, and it can use some room for improvement. And of course, there are a couple services that are discontinued, so you obviously can't improve something that doesn't exist anymore. But there's one particular service that comes to mind when I'm thinking about. There needing there being a lot of room for improvement, and of course we got the PlayStation Network to start off with. I mean, oh man, I think the play PSN is probably out of all of these is the one I have the most experience with, and of course there there's one or two that I have no experience with whatsoever because it was before my time. So I've obviously never used SegaNet before because I was I was like what one or two year years old when this when this thing was out. So, obviously, my opinion of SegaNet can't be as credible as my opinion on other things. But I decided to rank SegaNet as a B. Since we started talking about it, might as well get that over with. SegaNet was a good service for its time. Uh, it, in case you don't know what SegaNet was, it was the, the online multiplayer service for the Sega Saturn. So it started off in 1996, and then it was discontinued in 2001 following the discontinuation and ultimate failure of the Sega Dreamcast. But SegaNet came to the most prominence when it came when it came to uh, when it came to uh, the the Dreamcast. People didn't really use it on the Saturn. I, I believe one percent of all Saturn owners, which is already a small number, one percent of Saturn owners had online capabilities. So wasn't a big number uh, that had to do with the modem costing a, a pretty penny and they're not really being too much support but it was still for its time i mean can you think of too many online gaming services in 1996 that that did what it did it, low latency you're actually able to connect with people around the world and, and play games with them and on the dreamcast it was a pretty good service but there may be a question now why are you giving sony's ps2 online a d and you're giving SegaNet a b when in the grand scheme of things they were very similar in their infrastructure and overall capabilities and i will say two things one the dreamcast had a built-in modem from the get-go they 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 online gaming was was their vision from the beginning sega they had a partnership with with microsoft i believe to to, to have built-in modems with the with the Dreamcast, so uh, I don't have my Dreamcast with me right now. I'm not gonna pull it up, but from what I remember, uh, on the on like the front of the of the console itself, it says Sega, and then part, and then it also says like Microsoft, whatever, because they collaborate with Microsoft for the for the online and. For its time, it was pretty innovative. It it did a lot of good. And at that point, you didn't really have an online gaming service like that. Compared to the PS2 Online, which existed, which was launched right around the time of, 
Xbox Live. But when Sega Net existed, there was no such thing as Xbox Live. So by its standards, Sega Net was the best online gaming experience that you could ever have on a console, possibly on any gaming network at all. Sega Net was pretty damn innovative at its time. So that's why I'm going to give Sega Net a B. It was good. It definitely still, still was a lot to be desired. But it was an overall good service that was all around good. All right. I guess we'll move from right to left now because we, we decided to to be a little bit out of order. Let's talk about GOG or GOG. The same people who brought you the Witcher trilogy, which is the second best gaming trilogy. D don't please don't dislike this video for me saying that. Uh, no, I don't really, I don't really don't care. Um, you can disagree with me on that point, but I, I do think Mass Effect is a better trilogy than Witcher. But GOG undisputedly is a better service than Origin. Uh, GOG or GOG, I'll call it GOG because that's like the common saying for it. GOG is very innovative in the way that it approaches online DRM. In case you don't know, GOG is a DRM free digital storefront, an online gaming service. Just think about that. Think about that for a second. A DRM free digital storefront. DRM stands for Digital Rights Management and virtually every online service that you've seen, besides the older ones obviously, but all the modern ones, have some type of DRM in place. So that if the service shuts down, chances are your game is screwed. It was all that money wasted if, if the service closes down. But if GOG Hopefully not. Things are not looking good for GOG. They cut a lot of employees and they're doing a lot. CD Projekt Red's doing a lot of restructuring. But GOG is, uh, if GOG were to shut down, you'd still have access to your games. There would be no problems like there was with Games from Windows Live. And it's really the only storefront that has a system like this and it's a good system I wish this was the norm but there's probably too much money at stake for other storefronts to adopt a DRM free policy because at the end of the day they don't want you to just buy games they want to own you they want you to use their services they want you to have no other choice but to use their services so that if you do not use it, it will not functionally work. So imagine any EA game coming out today without Origin. They want you to use their Origin service. Same thing with Uplay. Even if you get the game on consoles, you still have to create a Uplay account and use their service. We are now in a service economy where DRM is essential for profitability, but GOG CD Projekt Red never really cared about that type of thing. I mean, for crying out loud, the Witcher trilogy, all the Witcher games are on Steam. And I think they even offered them on Origin, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, these games are just everywhere. They don't, they don't believe in exclusivity. They don't believe in, in, in like, you know, doing things like treating, treating the storefront as a business First and foremost, which, you know, maybe against common wisdom, maybe a lot of the reason why they're not doing so well right now, and I don't mean this to be mean, but let's face it, compare GOG to Steam, and even Epic, sadly, and it's not a good story. Uh, the game library, unfortunately, is not as extensive as that of Steam. It has a good catalog of older games, but... A lot of the new releases end up skipping GOG. Uh, they should probably have like a lower revenue cut to try to remedy that situation. But yeah, it's uh, 
I, I, I hope I hope GOG has a has a bright future. I can't imagine PC gaming ecosystem without it. It would be pretty scary. And I I hope it survives. And GOG Galaxy is a, is a decent social network. I mean, let's let's not forget the social the social aspect of it. Uh, back in the '90s, the late '90s uh, and early 2000s, uh, SegaNet was was huge in the, in this in the social experience because nothing like it was really ever attempted before. And with GOG, it's obviously not, uh, th their social experience is, you know, compared to modern standards, is kind of lackluster. But the innovations and, and the unique features that this storefront has over its competitors and their consumer-friendly approach to doing business has got to land GOG to a B ranking because it's good. It's not excellent, but it's good. And... You know, if it only had, like, if it had a library that rivaled that Steam's, and if it had some, you know, some key features that that uh, that Steam has that it doesn't, then GOG could could potentially have been an A. But I, I couldn't have, have given GOG an A, considering the, those circumstances. Then we have Google Play Games. I like Google Play a lot better than I like Apple when it comes to gaming. I know a lot of people prefer Apple because... When you're playing on a mobile phone uh, with an Apple phone, it, you know the specs that you have. Like, you know it's going to run properly. With Android, it's kind of like a loose cannon. Like, you don't know, depending on the type of phone that you have, if it's going to actually work or be compatible. Because there's so many goddamn Android phones. I mean, how long did it take for Snapchat to update? Like, to actually be good on Android? They, they, they like, uh, it was like, what, a month ago? that they fixed Snapchat and Android, but for like the, the five years of its existence, Snapchat was virtually broken on, on the Android. Like it, it, you had a pretty bad time on Snapchat. But we're not talking about social media, we're talking about gaming and Google actually, Google Play actually does have a gaming service. You can add friends, uh, you can actually record the screen with via Google Play, which I think is a really awesome feature. And the features that it lacks like well, actually, a lot of the games do have voice chat in-game and all that basic stuff that you would expect, even for a mobile phone. I mean, PUBG Mobile has voice chat. Uh, I think Call of Duty Mobile also has voice chat. But um, it's also, like, the features that it doesn't technically have, I mean, it's Google. So you can download an app for virtually anything, and it probably has all the features, but... It's still not as connected and not as like a, a, a as much of a, a, a good social experience as it is on th a lot of these other platforms, but it well makes up for it considering that the Android OS is probably one of the best operating systems to have ever been created. I can't imagine uh, ever switching to Apple or, or even a third OS because Android is just the pinnacle of, of smartphone like it's just it, when I think of smartphones I think of Android like automatically so uh, in terms of the online gaming it's it's a it's a decent amount better than Apple's thing especially if you incorporate Google services into it because they incorporate a lot of the Google platforms into it um, and I like Google a lot better so I guess it's personal preference because other than that, these two services are relatively the same, but yeah, I prefer Google Play. <laughs> Enough talking about smartphones. I'm sure you'd be like, stop talking about smartphones. I'm, I'm sick of hearing about it. Mobile gaming is terrible. Why are you even talking about mobile gaming? Well, we got to cover everything here. And whether you like mobile gaming or not, it has a place in the gaming industry. It's the most profitable part of the gaming industry which is also a, you know maybe a scary thought for a lot of people but it's it's just the way things are and now moving on to the PlayStation network okay the PlayStation network is is good <laughs> it needs a lot of work though so in the PlayStation 3 when it first started off it was bad like really bad it lacked a lot of features like it really wasn't until like a year later that uh, a lot of the basic features actually came to the PlayStation 3 online. But it was all it was kind of always behind Xbox Live, right? 
because Xbox Live just had better features. I mean, you had the cross game chat for starters. You had uh, overall, it was a better, better, better service. I mean, it wasn't as susceptible to hacking. Remember that anonymous hack back in 2011, where the PlayStation Network went out for like three weeks and you couldn't play your games online at all, and credit card information was stolen and all of that, and it hasn't really gotten too much better. I mean, I remember like two Christmases in a row, PlayStation Network was down. Or how about when the when the PS4 came out, PlayStation Network was down on Christmas because of the the, the high volume of, of Christmas people, I guess, <laughs> be buy, buying the PlayStation 4 for Christmas. And then you also had um, Lizard Squad, I think they were called, like a group of little kid hackers or whatever they were. They were just casually take down the PlayStation Network, just like that. So if you want to play your games online during the holidays tough shit <laughs> so the playstation network has a lot of room for improvement the loading times are abysmal i think that's going to improve though come next generation because i've heard a lot of stuff about the loading times being so fast and, the, and them really making improvements to their networking so that that's to be seen but as it currently stands right now in 2019 i can't rank the playstation network higher than a a b rank because uh it's competition its contemporaries are just everything that it does it does much better it used to have the free online thing to its advantage but now that now you have to pay for that on the playstation as well so it really doesn't have too many things over its competition besides the game library but uh, the, the overall service is not as good though so i can't say that the the service is as good as like xbox live for example because because it, it has better games, even though this, every aspect of the service is inferior to Xbox Live. And this is coming from someone that doesn't... That, 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 that his Xbox has been collecting dust as of late. And if you see my videos, I am far from an Xbox fanboy, so it has nothing to do with that at all. But yeah I, I can't I can't rank the playstation network higher than a b i've had a lot of enjoyment out of it like a lot of enjoyment and I, i've had great memories probably the best memories i've ever had with online gaming was with the playstation network but i cannot say that the playstation network is the best is among the best because it's a lot to be desired let's be honest even if you're the most hardcore playstation fan you cannot tell me that the playstation network's current status uh that 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 the that the infrastructure and overall how it is 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 even is even anywhere close to being excellent <laughs> you know what i mean so uh that's what we're gonna that's where we're gonna put the P, the playstation network so an a ranking and we're, we're nearing the end it's been a while the a ranking i think of services that are just completely uh that that do everything exceptionally well above its competition so uh, when, so like what, when we're talking about online services we're talking about the social aspect of it right so we're thinking of services that you know they have a good game library because obviously games are important but also has that true social experience where you truly feel like you're connected and you're part of a community and that's really what online gaming is all about is connecting with people as I've iterated uh, over the past hour or so so these and these are two services that are on the a ranking and there there is one on the s and the one on the s is just when i think of online gaming and obviously when i reveal the a ranking the the one on the s is going to be revealed but when i think of an s ranking i think of one that like is is just like the pinnacle of online gaming like everything that you could ever possibly want for, for an online gaming service is there. So that would be the distinction between A and S. So, without further ado, let's start with the A tier. Oh yeah, three services, sorry. Okay, so we have Xbox Live, which I'm sure some people are surprised that I didn't give it an S. But the reason why I didn't give it an S, I mean, there there is not, there is nothing. I mean, let's just let's just get this over with because you already know Steam is is uh, Steam is the S. 
All right, let's just get that over with because we, we need to go over this. We need to, to we need to do a comparison. Why the Xbox Live is an A, uh, Discord's an A. What the what the fuck is an X band? A lot of people are going to be asking. We'll, we'll we'll get into that. But why Steam is just above all the rest. And it's 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 uh, I tr trust me it's a coincidence I didn't I didn't put Steam in the S rank because S is Steam no, uh, or because I I'm just like obsessed with Game Newell, nothing like that. We're just being truthful here. There there is no service that exists that is better than Steam. Okay, so let's go down the list. Okay, of all these three services that do do a lot that that that's like better than than th that that's definitely among. The conversation of the best online gaming services to have ever existed and it might be a curious choice for a lot of people that i put discord above the playstation network because discord they sell games but i guess people don't really think of it as like a network but it is a network i mean it, it, it's taken a life of its own but the thing about Xbox Live, we'll start off with Xbox Live, and then we'll go to Discord, and then we'll go to X-Band, which people still are like, what the fuck is X-Band? <laughs> yeah. Um, Xbox Live was is, is like, it is probably one of the most innovative online gaming platforms to have ever existed. I'm not going to take that away from Xbox Live. I mean, when in 2002 when it came out, it really changed the game for online gaming. Uh, back, you know, 20 years ago, people didn't think that online gaming would be as significant as it is right now. But here we are right now, making a YouTube video on the internet <laughs> about online gaming. So the internet itself has, has really expanded since the late 90s, early 2000s. But uh, every, every generation, Xbox Live has exceeded expectations. Xbox Live is just... It's an amazing service. And I do not mean to take anything away from Xbox Live. And Steam, it's not even like Steam. If we, t if we do feature to feature, right? Xbox Live to Steam. These two platforms will be on an equal playing field. But with Xbox Live, you have the $60 a year subscription, which back then you could say was justifiable because there was no service released back then that even rivaled the social connectivity of Xbox Live. But if we're going to be fair and honest here... There is nothing that Xbox Live can do that the Steam that that the Steam platform cannot, and Steam can probably do a little bit more. But in terms of like features, like the cross game chat check, which is kind of <laughs> which is a meme because remember when I made that video saying that Steam does not have cross game chat and Rags roasted me like back in 2015. Yeah, uh, to any of you who remember that. <laughs> but yeah, cross game chat, friend chat groups all of those like key things that you would expect from a modern modern gaming service that they, they they're all they're both on an even playing field but the thing about xbox the thing about xbox live that really hurts it is the 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 online subscription fee because steam does not have any online subscription fee at all and if you're like a vr person steam has better vr steam has good vr support the steam vr platform i don't even think xbox live the xbox consoles even have vr as a service and overall xbox live is just it just lags a little bit behind because of that subscription fee and what are, what are the big features that xbox has been has been preaching backwards compatibility well steam has had that shit <laughs> there's no such thing as backwards compatibility on pc because there's no such thing as a generation so one of the Xbox Live's big, big, uh, big uh, engineering accomplishments over the past generation, which was backwards compatibility, is like a non-issue when it comes to Steam because it's of, of the platform it's on. It's on PC, so maybe you might make the argument that I'm not being fair because consoles and PCs are different realms. As a matter of fact, so are mobile and consoles. But I still have to give the edge to Steam. Uh, also, with a with a if you're talking about consumer friendly, the the amount of sales that you get on Steam and discounts uh, is is just uh, you can't compare it to what happens on Xbox Live. The overall game game catalog 
is significantly larger, which some people may argue is a is a shitty argument because there are a lot of shitty games, uh, a lot more shitty games that come out, and it's not curated. So, you know, every every day, like I think twenty games come out on Steam, and they don't really regulate it that much. So, an argument could be made that that's kind of a moot point, but I still think it's it's a point worth mentioning because at the end of the day, we 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 use an online gaming service to play games. We want to communicate with our friends, but we also want to have a lot of games to choose from, right? And with Xbox, you kind of have a more limited catalog, although they're starting to kind of play catch-up with the backwards compatibility, which is a good thing, but you still can't compare it to Steam. So that's my thing when it comes to Xbox Live having an A. It, it, it did a lot of innovation, and you can't take anything away from it in terms of uh, the, the contributions it's had to online gaming i think xbox live is online gaming to be honest with you but that doesn't mean it's the best of all time because it's it's existed alongside with steam throughout almost steam's entire existence well throughout almost xbox live's entire existence steam existed and uh, through a lot of that time steam has provided the better uh, experience to to gamers so Moving on to Discord. Discord is an online gaming service because it has a friend network, it has text chat, voice chat, and it was really built for gaming. So I'm not trying to say like, I'm not trying to compare it to like, like because some people would be like, well, if Discord can be on here, then so can Slack <laughs> or TeamSpeak. But Discord actually has a storefront of games. Uh, they kind of took that away I remember they were they announced the 90-10 cut, but for, now they're focusing on this Nitro service, which, eh, I don't know if that's necessarily a smart move, but Discord has truly revolutionized uh, the way that we communicate with each other online. And that's, that's a pretty big accomplishment, considering that uh, most of the innovations have already been made in the modern age, right? Like, like how much more innovation can you have? But Discord comes around and it's just everything like all the online all the the social functions of an online gaming service discord does it exceptionally well charges you absolutely nothing for it and does it better in a lot of cases i mean it's a, it's a much more seamless experience talking with your friends on discord than it is on xbox live and especially on playstation network I think Discord is an overall better platform than the PlayStation Network and the Xbox Live. If you're talking about like the actual, the actual like social experience, because Discord, I, I feel like Discord is PC gaming at this point. It's taken on a life of its own. I mean, Discord is just amazing. But Discord doesn't sell games, so I can't put on the S tier. Like, they sell games, but not nearly as much as Steam does. And they seem to be focusing on this Nitro service, but it's also an online gaming service where you can play with your friends, and all the games that you have across different launchers appear, and it's like a, a seamless, all-in-one gaming platform that combines everything into one. You can, even, you, can, you can connect Discord to Xbox, you can connect it to Steam, connect it to Origin, and Uplay, and all that. And whatever game you're playing on whatever platform will actually show up on Discord. And the the creation the, the, the Discord server really allows people to connect people with, with specific interest. I know PSN has groups, Xbox has groups, Steam has groups, but Discord does it better than them all. But at the same time, uh, we're talking about gaming platforms. And although these are great features for a gaming platform, Discord has a lot of potential to be someday on the S tier and to be better than Steam at this current stage it's just not Steam has a, a catalog of, of thousands upon thousands of games it really is, it is online gaming so it, it definitely it, like it it's weird because Discord I feel like more people actually chat on Discord than they do on Steam, although Steam does have a good chat. 
but I feel like there's a stronger sense of community on Discord than any other social gaming platform to have ever existed. So, that's my opinion on Discord. Now, what the hell is an X-Band? Well, X-Band was, was, was an interesting story. This was an online gaming service that launched back in 1994 and allowed you to play games online against other people, skill-based matchmaking included, and you were able to be matched up against other players around the world on the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo. It was a thing that you inserted into the cartridge slot and you could insert the cartridge into the thing and it was this whole online gaming experience, nothing that has ever been seen before. Definitely one of the most innovative gaming platforms to have ever existed because at that point, it was truly remarkable that a service like that existed. You've had online gaming services technically to have existed before, like Satellaview, uh, Sega Channel, but those were content, those things focused on content delivery, and that might be a separate video. So when you think of content delivery gaming services, you think of uh, Discord Nitro, for example, or PlayStation Now, Xbox Game Pass, Origin Access, which I am a subscriber to. So those were really like a lot of the services you had. It was over a satellite modem and you can only download, like you, you would download it over the, the modem and you could only do it during certain times of the day. It was just like this weird thing, but X-Band was simply play the games you have online and uh you know they they however i think they charged what 4.95 a month which was actually even for back then for the service that they provided was pretty damn reasonable and back then you had the problem with uh having like the having the internet thing connected to a phone line because that's how online gaming or online anything was back then connected to a computer uh, you had a lot of problems where like services would like from the from the mid 90s to the early 2000s where these services would like would have a lot of problems like you you'd be cut out of the game if like a call was incoming <laughs> I, I i kind of remember the experience of dial up vaguely so i'm sorry if i'm not describing it very well but x band actually remedied that pretty good by uh, pausing the game for you and like not like, like it was a lot easier like it was it was a good experience playing games online on x band for for its time essentially and it was definitely one of the most innovative online gaming services to have ever existed and that's why it deserves an a rank because can you imagine in 19 growing up in 1994 having a service like this being able to play games online with low latency it, it, it was just mind-boggling that such a thing existed, but it did. And it was truly remarkable, truly innovative, and it's one of those things in gaming history that isn't really talked about enough, but it had a significant impact on the industry. So that's why X-Band also deserves an A ranking, because at its time, I mean, it, it was just so remarkably innovative. I mean, SegaNet was a bit innovative as well, but not to the extent of x band So that's why SegaNet's a B and x bands an A. So, wow. <laughs> An hour and 24 minutes almost we've been doing this. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you guys think about, about this ranking? Do you guys agree? Disagree? And what do you guys want to see next? Do you want to see controllers next? Because I was I was thinking about doing that, but I decided to do this first. Is that what you want to see next month? Controllers. I'm also planning on doing add-ons. So the the best add-ons, like ranking the add-ons from worst to best. So worst would be, well, I'm not gonna give it away, but just think of add-ons to consoles like the PlayStation VR and the Kinect, that kind of stuff. The Sega CD. Those are console add-ons. So if you want to see that next, let me know. And then I also have console redesigns, like the PlayStation 2 Slim, for example, the Xbox One X, 
So I have a, a ranking system for redesigned consoles as well. So that is about it for this month. Uh, I'm going to try to make more videos uh, more frequently. Uh, I am done with school, so I really don't have any good excuse to not make videos. I've just been uh, caught up with a few things. So I want to get this podcast out of the way, and it's going to take a long-ass time to upload. I know that already. So I hope you guys enjoy the effort and me losing my voice <laughs> almost because my, my throat is really sore. <laughs> talking for so long. I hate talking for so long. I, I really don't like talking for an extended period of time. I don't know how I did that debate with Bullet Barry for four hours, but these days I kind of struggle with having these long conversations, especially with myself, because I'm just talking and talking and talking, and I, I keep talking, so I better stop. <laughs> Let me know what you guys think down below about this ranking. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know down below. I appreciate uh, I appreciate you tuning in and I'll see you guys in June for the next ranking and hopefully a lot sooner than June uh, for my next video. I'm going to give you a very important channel update because let's face it there's been a lot of uh, questions surrounding the future of this channel so next video will uh, directly address that point so looking forward to that. Anyway thanks for watching see you later bye.